Now that we know how gametes are produced during the process of meiosis, we can use that information to predict how traits will be inherited from parents to offspring. In this first video, we're going to take a look at a few Mendelian inheritance patterns. Now, you might be asking yourself, what's a Mendelian inheritance pattern? Well, it's an inheritance pattern that was observed by Gregor Mendel. This is a very famous biologist. Uh, he lived a long time ago. He was an Austrian monk who discovered some principles of genetics while doing some experiments with his garden peas. Um, and he showed through these experiments that parents could pass factors on to their offspring. He didn't know at the time that those factors were genes made of DNA, but he did observe inheritance. And just to put some context around this, his findings were published in 1866, which was only a few years after Darwin published his theory of natural selection. So one of the experiments that Mendel did was a genetic cross. And during a genetic cross, two individuals are deliberately bred together. They're deliberately reproducing. And so one of the crosses he did was to take a purple pea plant and cross it or breed it with a white pea plant. And this produces what is known as an F1 generation. So P, the first group that is bred together, is your parental generation. Their offspring is the F1 generation. And he noticed when he did this cross that all of the offspring were purple, uh, which led him to think that certain traits were more powerful than other traits. But then what he did is he took these offspring, these F1 plants, and he had them self-fertilize. This is something cool that plants can do because most plants have male and re female reproductive organs, so they can fertilize themselves. So when these purple plants fertilized themselves, they had offspring known as the F2 generation, the second generation of offspring. And this time Mendel noticed that most of the plants were purple, but a few of them were white. And that led him to some interesting questions about how inheritance works. Why did we get all purple plants this time, but only some purple the second time around? Well, in order to understand why this happened, let's review how genes are organized. We know that in eukaryotes, there are homologous pairs of chromosomes. Well, here's one pair of chromosomes that might be in that plant. And on this pair of homologous chromosomes are the genes for flower color. And since there's two chromosomes in a homologous pair, there are two different genes that encode flower color. And the genes may or may not be identical. In this case, they're not identical. This gene, or allele, uh, encodes a purple flower, but this gene, or allele, encodes a white flower. So here we see that alleles are different versions of genes that encode the same trait. You'll also notice that alleles for the same trait are in the same spot or locus on a homologous chromosome. And some alleles can be dominant over other alleles. For example, in this homologous pair, there is one dominant allele for purple flowers, and there's one recessive allele for white flowers, and yet this plant would appear purple. Uh, that's because this allele is overpowering this one. There only needs to be one of them present. This recessive allele is weaker, so to speak, so in order for the recessive trait to appear, we need two copies of this recessive allele. And let's take a look at how that works. There's a big difference between the genes that an organism has and the traits that are expressed or that appear um, as observable physical characteristics. So a word that means trait is phenotype. So for example, purple flower or white flower, that's a phenotype, a trait. The genes that determine that trait though are known as the genotype. So in order to have the phenotype of purple, a flower could have two different genotypes. It could have two dominant P alleles, homozygous dominant, or it could have a dominant and a recessive P allele. This is known as heterozygous or hybrid. In order for the white phenotype to appear, the genotype needs to be two recessive 
p alleles, two lowercase p alleles. And this is homozygous as well because they're both lowercase p's. So important terms, homozygous, also known as true breeding, is when there are two dominant or two recessive alleles, in this case or in this case. Heterozygous is when there's one dominant allele and one recessive allele, and that's also known as a hybrid. So in order to predict and explain why certain traits are inherited the way they are, you have to be able to determine the genotypes of gametes as well as the genotypes of the parents. So let's take an example. Here is a cell from one of those parent plants. Now within this cell, we see a homologous pair of chromosomes. Note that there's a lot of other homologous chromosomes in the cell, but we're just focusing on this one pair because it has the genes for flower color. Now the genotype of this parent cell is uppercase P, lowercase p. If this cell were to divide by meiosis to make gametes, the gametes are gonna have one of these two chromosomes. So we might have a gamete that receives the dominant uppercase P, or we might have a gamete that has the lowercase recessive P allele. So again, bear in mind that because of meiosis, a gamete is going to have one chromosome from the original homologous pair. So now let's see how we can use all of this information to predict and explain inheritance patterns. What we're gonna do right now is a monohybrid cross. It's a cross because we are breeding two different parental organisms. It's a monohybrid because both of the parents are hybrids. They've got two different alleles. And it's a monohybrid cross because we're only concerned with one trait right now, flower color. So if these are the parents and they're diploid and these are their homologous chromosomes, the next thing we need to think about is what gametes can they produce? Well, this parent can produce a gamete with a dominant P or a recessive P. And this parent can produce a gamete with a dominant P or a recessive P. Now, these potential gametes could fertilize these potential gametes. To see all the possible combinations, we're going to make a Punnett square. And then we're going to cross our possible gametes. If this gamete and this gamete fuse during fertilization, here's what the offspring would look like. It would have two dominant Ps, and it would be purple. But maybe this gamete and this gamete fertilize, in which case, we would also get a purple flower, but this time the purple flower's genotype is a dominant P with a recessive P. It's heterozygous. We could also cross this gamete with this gamete and again get a heterozygous purple flower. Or we could cross this gamete with this gamete. They would fuse during fertilization. And now, very interesting, we have our white flower because in this gamete, or in this offspring, this zygote, one gamete was carrying a recessive allele and the other gamete was carrying a recessive allele. And when they fused, the diploid organism is going to have the recessive trait. So there are some important ratios to note from this monohybrid cross. One important ratio is the phenotype ratio. We're gonna get three to one dominant to recessive traits whenever we have a monohybrid cross. Of course, this is statistical, so the bigger your sample size, uh, the better your results would be. In terms of genotype, anytime we cross two monohybrids, uh, we're gonna have one genotype that's homozygous dominant, two uppercase letters. And then we're gonna have two genotypes that are heterozygous, one uppercase, one lowercase. And then we will have one genotype that is homozygous recessive. Both alleles are lowercase recessive. So that leads us to a one to two to one ratio. And it's important to note whether you're talking about phenotype, the trait, which is three to one, or genotype, the genes, which is one to two to one. We can also put this in percentage form and say that this is 75% to 25% or 25, 50, 25%. Let's do one more cross, a different cross, different parents. One of our parents is heterozygous dominant for the purple flower color. 
You can see the dominant allele and the recessive allele. The other parent is homozygous recessive for white flower. You can see that this parent has both recessive alleles. First thing to ask ourselves, what gametes can they produce? Well, this parent can produce a gamete with the dominant allele or a gamete with the recessive allele. This parent can only produce gametes with the recessive allele because that's all it's got. So now to see the combinations, let's draw a Punnett square, and then we're going to combine our possible gametes. If these gametes fertilize, we get heterozygous dominant purple. If these gametes fertilize, we get homozygous recessive white. If these gametes fertilize, heterozygous dominant again. And then finally, we have homozygous recessive. So this is a new ratio. We now have 50% that are heterozygous dominant purple and 50%, two out of four, that are heterozygous, or excuse me, homozygous recessive white. And if we put that in ratio format, we have a one-to-one -one genotype and phenotype ratio because half of them are purple, half are white, half are heterozygous, and half are homozygous. And those are some important Mendelian ratios. One last thing to note is that, unfortunately, most human traits are not quite this simple. It's not as easy as just one dominant gene and one recessive gene. But it's important to know these basic patterns so that you can then predict more complex patterns, which we'll look at in class.